I am Richie Brave and I'm a presenter and broadcaster. My name is Dr. Mecca, I'm an emergency doctor. However, I'm also an influencer who loves to entertain and educate the country with my medical knowledge. So look out for me. Hi, my name is Dr. Veena. I'm a full-time NHS GP working in London and I also teach dance. <laughs> my voice is loud so I can just shout if that works. <laughs> But welcome, it's good to have you all today, um, just to have this conversation. And I think it's really important that tonight is a safe space for us to be honest about what we've experienced over the past 18 months. Um, I'll begin by saying, you know, as people from Black, Asian, minority, ethnic groups in the UK, there's a specific experience that we have, right? And it isn't just related to COVID, it's related to everything. If you look at education, if you look at policing, if you look at communities in general, there are very specific experiences that overlap. So obviously this conversation today is about COVID, um, vaccines, etc. I'd say no question is a bad question, is a wrong question. I don't know about you, but I get enough messages from my aunties and uncles on WhatsApp. And sometimes I'm a little bit like, yo, like, it's, <laughs> is that true? Isn't it true? Yeah. So this is a space for you to ask questions really. But, um, it's not about me. I'm just here to facilitate a little bit. I just want to welcome my guests to the stage. So do you want to tell people who you are, a bit about what you do, etc.? <clears throat> sure thing. So my name is Dr. Emeka. Uh, some of you may recognize me from like TikTok or Instagram. I do a lot on social media in terms of medicine. I'm an a &E doctor by profession at the moment. I've worked a lot with different brands, different groups, talking to young people and talking to people about the vaccine. I've been on news quite a bit speaking about it too, because I've worked on the Corona Awards as well as A&E. And so like, I have first-hand kind of experience about what COVID can do. And that's why like, as soon as the vaccines were able for us to get them, I got mine ASAP and I encouraged all my friends, my family. And I know that a lot of young people have questions. I've had like loads of DMs and questions on the street of people asking me about the vaccine side effects, et cetera, et cetera. So that's why I thought, you know what, come here. And as he said, as Richie said, there's a safe space for everyone to ask questions about the vaccine and whatnot and the booster jab. So that's, that's a little bit about me. Um, hi guys, my name is Dr. Veena. I'm also uh, a full-time NHS doctor. I'm a GP by profession. So I qualified last year as a GP during the pandemic. And it was, if I'm honest, it was an absolutely crazy time trying to pass exams balance what you're meant to do as a trainee, working in A&E, doing out of hours, doing clinical work, staying on top of everything, um, dealing with all the uncertainty. So it, it was, we were talking about this earlier today, it was a very character building time for us. Mm. And I think we can appreciate wherever you are in your training or wherever you are coming from, you know, with all the uncertainties, with information from television, from WhatsApp groups, from your friends, mm. you don't know what to believe, who to listen to please feel free to ask us anything that's on your mind. We hope that this is a safe space for you to just discuss things with us so we can maybe address some of those concerns in a very easy and simple way. Um, I also teach dance on the side. I have a passion for movement and wellness and I hope that if any of you have interest in those areas, we can discuss that too because fitness is always good. Um, but yeah, I hope we can address some of your questions today about the vaccination and COVID-19. Great, thank you. I should have said who I am. So my name's Richie Brave, right? It'd be good for you to know that. Um, and talking of boosters, I had mine yesterday. My arm is very sore. Um, but in terms of this conversation, this isn't about convincing people to do anything. This is about giving you information to make an informed decision, whatever you choose. So don't think this is propaganda. We're not bringing you here to convince you to do something that you don't want to do. Essentially, we all have autonomy to make decisions. And it's just important that when we are making decisions, we're informed when we do this. So it's a space to be honest. It's a space to empower you to get more information, share your experiences, share some of your apprehensions, share the information that you do know, talk about why you do want to get the vaccine, don't want to get the vaccine, why you're unsure. Well, I mean, you said you've worked on COVID wards, so we know it exists, but there's some people that are unsure whether it exists or not. This is a space to explore that. So when I said there's no such thing as a silly question, we mean that. There's no point in holding these things inside. We walk out the door and we think, oh, I wish I would have asked that question today. So in short, this isn't just us sitting up here talking to you directly. This isn't some sort of presentation. We're gonna break into smaller groups um, just to explore the subjects a bit more in smaller groups so we're able to you know, explore them in a little bit more detail. Um, but we have facilitators who will be doing that for you. Facilitators, you wanna raise your hand so people know who you are? Got it. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, but I wanna get into the bit that people think is boring. 
but I love a bit of this. I'm a facts and figures man, you know what I mean? When someone tries to challenge me, I always like to lay the facts on their head so they can't say nothing. Yeah. So um, talk to me a bit about the facts and figures around COVID, specifically its effects on black, Asian, minority, ethnic communities. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think that's why we have these figures down, right? We're not here to bore you, but mm -hmm. I think it's important to just kind of lay a background of why we're addressing this. Why is this so important and why are we so passionate about it? So in London, right, ethnic groups with the lowest rates of vaccination, which means mm. the highest proportion of unvaccinated people are black Caribbean, black other and mixed white and black Caribbean. This is around 50% vaccinated compared to 85% of say white British, 50% to 85. That's a big difference, right? Do you all agree? Yeah, it's a big difference. So it just makes you think, why is that? You know, is it the beliefs? Is it something they've seen? Is it personal experiences? So that is a big difference I think um, we should see. And the pattern's also present, not just in the general public, but also in NHS staff. Mm. So everyone is kind of seeing this, yeah. It's true. When you, when you like break it down into age, in terms of age groups, and 16 to 17 year olds, 54% of people are, 57% uh, of people are unvaccinated. So that's more than half. Obviously, I know in terms of rolling out the vaccine, the younger people came obviously last in the food mm. chain because we want to get the older people, the more vulnerable people vaccinated. But now that it's available for everyone, we want to see that kind of uptake. In 18 to 24 year olds, 44%. So we just vaccinated just over half. And in 25 to 39 year olds, 41%. So it's better as it goes up in age, but obviously there are a couple of factors that the vaccine has been around longer for those who are older and they have more access to it. But now it's time that obviously of all ages, everyone over the age of 16 and over, we're encouraging to make sure they can go and get vaccinated, especially if they're suffering from long-term health con condition. And then this taking into account younger groups. And the thing is that I need to stress is that the vaccine, there's no evidence that affects black people differently. I think there was a stigma where black people often thought like this was an agenda against them and that's why the government was pushing to roll it out in like predominantly black communities however what the issue was is terms of what how covid was affecting us black people were three times more likely to be severely ill when covid was going through the first wave and that's why especially in the areas i've worked in so i worked in um, hospital i was working in essex so rumford ilford and east london in homerton mm -hmm. as well as harlow and these are very very diverse areas with a number of different black people and we had our colleagues were getting unwell we had patients getting unwell so you were kind of seeing at first hand mm -hmm. that black people were high risk being a black individual or being part of the BAME community was mm -hmm. high risk and that's why we've been pushing people to get information and make decisions on vaccinating themselves and their families yeah and i think i agree with that because black Asian and minority ethnic groups were more at risk, not of just getting COVID, but also getting severe outcomes and severe adverse effects from COVID. We saw this firsthand. Yeah. I saw this in the community where, you know, it still pains me to share this and talk about it, but people in their late 30s and early 40s losing other halves, you know, kids being left without parents. And you just think they're just a few years older than you. This shouldn't be happening to young people. So there was a genetic predisposition which means that people of colour were being affected differently to mm -hmm. the condition. So there are facts to you know, say that. So in the UK's first wave, black people were nearly three times more likely to die from COVID than white people. And that is a sad reality of what happened. And every time I speak about this, it is with a heavy heart and we can't belittle what, you know, the losses that we've had. Um, in London itself, there were ethnic minorities you know, comprised of 34% of the population. But Although that's only 34% of our entire population, they form 48% of our health force, 54% of people in food production, and 44% of transport workers. So if you think about it, they're a massive part of our frontline workers, mm -hmm. you know, and that in itself, because they have higher exposure, they will contract things that are, you know, out there in the play, you know, playing yeah. ground, as per se. So that could have been one of the factors as well. And again, black and Asian doctors make up 44% of NHS staff. So we're, all, we're all out there, yeah. That's it's a lot. it's all out there. That's a lot. When you think about it, because of all the doctors um, who died from COVID, and I know a few of them, 95% mm. were people of color. So if you think about that, that's kind of staggering. Yeah. And you know what they say, women lie and men lie, but numbers don't lie. As in, we know who was passing <laughs> from COVID. And the thing is, it's, it's hard for, for you maybe to comprehend, but for me who was kind of seeing it, and I saw a number of uh, my older colleagues who were black and Asian admitting on ITU. And when yeah. you're treating people 
who you think might die, who you literally you were working with last week, it kind of impacts you because you're fearing for yourself, you're fearing for your family, you're thinking what's going to happen to what's going to happen to my aunt, what's going to happen to my uncle, what's going to happen yeah. to nan, dad, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, because they're at high risk. That's why I was pushing it so much in my older family members, and they knew, they knew to listen because they're like, you know what, what he's saying isn't rubbish. Yeah. He's seen it, and that's why he's pushing us to get there. So. It's, it's unfortunate what we've seen, but the good thing is now we have a vaccine, now we have a booster, we have a way out. There was a point in time where it looked like a black tunnel. There didn't seem to be a way out. We were just seeing people die. We didn't have a treatment. We didn't really have a vaccine. We didn't really have anything. We just had hope. We were just doing what we could and trying to prevent it, prevent the spread, which we I still are today. I don't even think we had hope. Until the vaccine came. I don't even know if there was hope because me, there was so was, much negativity. I don't know if you guys agree. It was constant negative, it, negative news it was in the tough. media. It was tough. Yeah. It, was, it was just like, when is this going to end? Yeah. We just didn't know when it was going to end. We didn't know how we were going to get back to normal. At least now we have an answer. We have some sort of light at the end of the tunnel. Obviously, we're still doing what we can in terms of social distancing, wearing our masks, having good hand hygiene so we don't catch COVID. But at least now... We know if you are vaccinated, if you do have your booster, if you do contract COVID, you're way less likely to get seriously ill and end up in hospital like you would have a year ago. Yeah. That 95% statistic is staggering. Mm -hmm. It's a lot. 95 is, is, it's a lot. Yeah, look, was there information to, did, to, did people know why? Is there, can it be explained? Because I'm sure lots of people so, are sitting there thinking, well, 95% is high. There are a number of theories and there are a number of theories when it first happened, I think, especially with black and Asian uh, doctors, a number of them are suffering from a number of diseases like kidney disease, hypertension, high cholesterol, which we all know were negative risk factors for having COVID. Also in terms of exposure. So a lot of the black and Asian doctors, such as myself, work frontline mm -hmm. in terms of A&E, in terms of COVID wards, and you're, so you're seeing ill patients. So mm -hmm. I had a very, very high risk of actually contracting COVID because I was working on a COVID ward. So every patient I saw Thanks. for about two, three months every day was positive. So think about that. Your chances of you getting COVID mm. is a lot higher than. So I think that's, that's some of the theories that they, they thought about in terms of the genetics that, that go into it and environmental factors as well. Yeah, and I think afterwards studies looked into why it was just black and ethnic minorities and they actually found that there is a genetic predisposition that means we are affected a yeah. bit differently to the virus. Okay. So that then this came to the forefront yeah. afterwards, which then tied in all the loose ends and we saw actually... Things are there starting was, to make sense. Yeah, things are starting to make sense. That's fascinating and I think this is why these conversations are so important because mm -hmm. this information, although it's free to access and we can access it, it isn't always out there, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because we don't have an opportunity to sit in front of a doctor. Usually it's 10 minutes. Yeah, yeah. Like, my back hurts. Like, can you give me something for it? And then you're out, right? But yeah. to be able to explore this, I think is important. I like the fact that you touched on the beginning. I mean, my dad was in intensive care for two months. We nearly lost him. My family have lost eight people oh. to COVID. But you go into work with my white colleagues mm. and they're like, oh, I don't know anyone who's died. Yeah. And you know, yeah. like, you know, like, lots of my, as I'm from South London, New Cross, who grew up in a very like black heavy yeah, area. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I, I don't think I don't know anyone who hasn't lost somebody. Yeah. It's either a family member or a friend of a friend. Exactly. You know? Or know somebody who was severely ill with COVID. I remember I was speaking um, on Arsenal TV about the same thing. I'm not an Arsenal fan though, so <laughs> don't come at me. But I was speaking on Arsenal TV about it and Robbie and a couple of the guys who are regulars, they were like, yeah, a lot of black people were talking about, oh, is it a conspiracy, this, mm -hmm. this, this, but like, people dying is not a conspiracy. It's no. not, Especially it's not fake. And this, and this is way before the vaccine. No. So people are like, oh, the vaccine's out to get black people and kill black people and this. Yeah. These people were dying from COVID. Mm. As in, not from a vaccine, these people were dying from COVID. Vaccines don't kill people, but COVID does. And so that's what we're yeah. doing, everything to prevent people from getting COVID. And it was just trying to hit home about our own personal experiences. So yeah. I was in part of a government campaign um, where we had a video of patients in ITU and they went and videoed people in ITU yeah. to appeal to the public yeah. to you know stay inside and take care of themselves because they're like you don't want to end up like me on, mm. on death, knocking on death's door mm. and as a campaign I did where I've spoken to patients, I've spoken to people, younger people who suffered from long COVID so these are long term, um, long term symptoms of COVID so even if you haven't gone to hospital you may still be symptomatic for, for a very very long time. It's something they're still trying to figure out why long COVID happens and why it's affecting younger people but this is stuff I'm still telling people mm -hmm. I remember the first um after the first lockdown that week when everyone was trying to get back into enjoyment enjoyment I was on call I was on call um in a hospital in Essex and that first day when everyone came out I admitted a 24 year old up into ITU 
who had literally wow. been breaking lockdown rules. So he'd been yeah. fandangoing in the community or whatever. He admitted to me and he caught COVID and he got very, very unwell. He, he did live, he did live, but he, it, it kind of opened his eyes. He's like, I just can't breathe. Like, mm. I had to come to the hospital because I just can't breathe. He's like, I'm normally fit and healthy. I don't know what's going on. Mm-hmm. And I tried to educate him. I said, listen, we know the facts about COVID and who's more vulnerable. However, COVID can affect people differently. Mm. Yeah. Your symptoms may be different from the person next mm-hmm. to you, maybe different from your family member. You don't know, so you'd rather not catch it. You'd rather do what you could to protect yourself. Yeah. And that's why we're doing what we're doing here, to speak to people in the community and tell them what we've seen and tell them how they can protect themselves and give them a chance to make informed decisions. It makes sense. How are people feeling listening to that? Is <laughs> everyone engaged, ready to have conversations? Yeah. yeah. Cool. And I should have given a disclaimer at the beginning. Obviously, this is a heavy subject, right? And we've spoken about people losing people. It affects your health. And if something does become too much for you and this conversation becomes difficult, there was always a space for you to go and take a breath and take a minute. Mm. I mean, even me, I'm talking about my dad and there's a bit of a lump in my throat, you know? It's it's an upsetting conversation. So when we talk about safe spaces, it's safe for you to share whatever you're thinking and feeling, but it's also safe for you to take some time out because it's a really heavy subject matter. So don't feel like you just have to power through it, even though you're feeling a little bit uncomfortable. Take that time. If you need to speak to one of the facilitators, myself or anybody inside the room, take that time. Take one of us away and talk to us. Yeah. Um, so before we dive into questions, yeah. right? Um, in terms of one of the big questions, we live in a racist society in the UK. We mm. can't dance around it. That kind of is what it is. Mm. I'm sure people try and th- yeah, right. What was that government report recently? Racism doesn't exist institutional, right? <coughs> we know what it is. Yeah, you yeah. know what I mean? So given that we live in a society like that and we've spoken about education, schooling, policing, all of that, it disproportionately affects black, Asian, minority, ethnic groups. And this is why we're having this conversation today. So I feel like there is a rational distrust of official sources sometimes. Mm. Yeah. And that's kind of been embedded in some of the experiences that people have. Yeah. Um, and I think it's really important that we explore that today. So if you are dubious and you are a bit like, yo, I've had this experience and I'm a little bit suspicious, bring that into the room. You are fine to do that. Um, but given that, like, how do young black, Asian, minor ethnic people make good decisions about what to do, given there is so much mistrust and there are very real experiences? I think what tends to happen sometimes is yeah. people are a little bit suspicious, dubious. They get looked down on and shut down by people. Yeah. How, how do you navigate? How can people begin to navigate that space in a way that's safe for them? I, th- I think that's a that's a very good question. I think a, p- a part of it, in the first and foremost, is you know getting information from people who look like you, first who are in those positions. So a lot of people may not trust um, the NHS. They may not trust the government. No. However, if someone looks like you and someone's young and black and talking to you about this, you're, you're thinking, okay, you know what? He's experienced what I've experienced. He's gone through what I've had to go through. So if he's saying this, it must be coming from a place of truth because why would somebody who's looked like me, who's had my experiences, who's been in the same government as me, who's maybe been affected by racism too, why would he be trying to put me Mm. down and lie to me? And I think that's why, I think me, that's why I I felt like I had an ethical obligation to go and talk to people because I've experienced racism at work, outside of work, just generally. As in- We all have to some dose. Yeah, we all have (laughs) to some dose. So they, oh, trust when they say the UK um, is, isn't racist, a lot of the people saying this haven't actually experienced mm-hmm. racism and that's why they're saying it. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't say this is a completely racist place. However, there are pockets of racism. There's racism, it exists and it's everywhere and it can affect anyone who's um, of color. It can affect anyone negatively. Mm-hmm. Don't think just because I, I thought, oh, just because I'm a doctor, this, 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 you're not safe. You're not safe. And that's why I, I did uh, a video of um, don't, um, don't clap for me my scrubs and hate me in my hoodie. Because there was a time where obviously everyone was clapping for the NHS, Thursdays, eight o'clock, blah, blah, blah. but then all of a sudden, <laughs> the, the minute I wear my hoodie and just go to the gym, or I'm just trying to get to football, I'm being stopped by police. Not people holding pushing. their bag away from yeah, you. Yeah, people <laughs> crossing the street away from me. I'm like, okay. You are six yeah. foot six as well. Yeah, true. <laughs> <laughs> Even I'm looking up to you. <laughs> But that's the thing, I was like, but when I was wearing my scrubs and everyone can see I'm a doctor, it's a, it's a different yeah. thing, but I'm the same guy yeah. in the hoodie and in the scrubs. Yeah. And that's what I tried to put across, that even me as a doctor, I've experienced it. And so I think part of that is getting information from people, you know, who look like you, who are from your community. I think that's very important. Thank you. I think also, also question, right? I think as young people, I would encourage all of you to just be very inquisitive, question the source. Who's written it? Why have they written it? Yeah. Who have they written it for? 
Is it in the metro? Is it written by just someone who has no scientific background? Is it a scientist? Is it a professor? Yeah. Are they a physician? Do they have you know, some letters before their name, after their name? Yeah. That in itself should be enough as credibility. Even if you don't know their race, their background, they're, you know, they're a professor of you know, microbiology at Harvard. They, they might know a thing or two about the virus. You know what I mean? <laughs> mm. So really, I always encourage young people to question why and what and where, because that's what will kind of help you decipher what is this information, what do I do with it? And I say this because in South Asian communities as well, you know, my mum would tell me, there is this turmeric you should rub on your face in this direction. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and there's a mango you should eat at this time of day that will do this. And I'm like, who told you this? Like, WhatsApp, it's going around. And, mm. and it's really hard to break it because to you it might think, oh, but someone's just obviously fabricated this and sending it around. Yeah. But to communities where that is their source of information, it's hard to get through to them that that is wrong information. Mm -hmm. You know, we were running um, COVID clinics where we give vaccinations at practices. And we had this gentleman who told his entire church that they could come and get the Pfizer vaccine. But on that day, we were giving AstraZeneca. So we told him, oh, no, it's AstraZeneca today. He said, oh, no, 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 but I've told the church that 15 people are coming now to get it. We were like, it doesn't matter what you've said. This is what's happening. So he had to then get on the phone and this whole coach had to get cancelled. And we were like, but who did you ask before inviting everybody? So I think really question the source and ask why, what and where. So even if you don't know who's behind that information, you can, you know, your young, smart mind, you're our future. You can decide for yourself. Mm -hmm. Should I believe what's in front of me? Is there something you want to add? No, no. I was literally just going to reiterate uh, yeah, Kavina's point because I've seen some of these videos going around WhatsApp, same, Facebook, same. <laughs> and Instagram, and I just, I They're just, creative, right? I, yeah, I just can't <laughs> understand where people are getting all this information. And the thing is, misinformation is deadly because as it spreads, it spreads like a yeah. virus, yeah, almost. And it's like, oh no, I heard. I and they make the misinformation so sexy. So, yeah, it's like, <laughs> yeah. It's a, yeah. And the thing is, people can, especially black people, can naturally be quite skeptical when told something because you don't want to believe everything you're told. As in, everyone has, you know, the kind of mentality, believe uh, none of what you hear and half of what you see, that sort of thing. So when people are saying, especially if it hasn't affected you, you, you might be skeptical. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, people are giving you information like, ah, the microchips or nah, it's going to affect pregnancy or nah, they're trying to control yeah. you, bro. Like, I, I remember I was doing an interview right at the beginning when the vaccine came out for Sky News. And I was in uh, Victoria Park in East London going around asking people. I remember coming up to view a group of black guys uh, playing basketball. And then he went, nah, bro, it's a control thing. He's like, it's a control thing. I was like, nah, man. I was like, where are you getting this? He's like, nah, but one of my brothers told me because he knows somebody who knows okay. somebody. And I was like, okay. So what this is, is a bit of Chinese whispers yeah. with fake, fake news, yeah. essentially. As Donald Trump stuff, there's fake news. It's, it's, mm. it's just not true. Yeah. And I was like, we have facts and figures. We have research about the vaccine. We have anecdotal evidence mm. from doctors. We have professors. We have virologists. We have people in public health England and we're all trying to say the same thing mm -hmm. to battle all the misinformation. So you just have to be careful of who you're listening to and where you're getting your info. Yeah. I think you've both made such an important point because the misinformation can target the justified skepticism. Yeah. Right? And I, 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 my mum is South Asian and my dad is West Indian. And it's so interesting. So I'm on both sides, right? And I can see the same misinformation in yeah. the South Asian community written in a particular way <laughs> and the West that. Indian community. And it's the same stuff, same stuff but just written in a way that I would appeal people, to. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. exactly. But I also think, Richie, it's also perspective, right? Depending on, like you said. Tell me some more. So if, for instance, I had people who are not in the medical background going through the first lockdown, coming out, learning how to make banana bread and like feeling more relaxed and, you know, having working from home. And I remember thinking, this is the hardest I've ever worked in my life, you know, yeah. when they're talking about having so much time off and couldn't relate because yeah. it was the hardest I had worked in my life and seeing death day in, day out, then coming home, not seeing your family, then studying for exams and going back yeah. and doing it all over again. You're exhausted, right? But then you don't want to keep telling others how exhausted you are because you don't want them to be down putting a brave yeah. face. Guys, it was exhausting. It really was. You Rough know? times. Yeah, and I remember vividly, I had fun. a patient who, who rang because he, had, he was having a mental breakdown. So he worked at a cemetery and he couldn't cope with the amount of burials that were happening because each burial could only allow three people at yeah. a time. This is at the peak of things, right? And he was like, I, I just can't cope. I can't do the shift anymore. There's not enough space for the bodies. And I was on the other side of this thinking, oh my goodness, how can someone sit and tell me this is made up? You know, when, yeah. I, when our patients are the ones dealing with these bodies and burying them and putting them in the ground. And 
it just becomes very palpable and very real. It was very frustrating, so, very yeah. frustrating so to hear people yeah. talking about COVID being made up and the virus isn't real. Listen, I don't need to start answering the questions before we get to the breakout groups. <laughs> You're getting ahead of us and I'm just aware of time. So I think yeah. now is a good time to go to the breakout, breakout groups. So what I'll say in terms of questions and the kind of things I want you to think about, but bring your own stuff as well, is historical mistrust of vaccination programs in black communities, perceptions of the health service and government, and how events in the US might influence our decisions over here. So the world is getting a lot smaller. Yeah. It's starting to become a global world. I want you to think about that kind of stuff and also all the questions that you have. So facilitators, I'll ask you to break people into their breakout spaces. <laughs> Let's start. Um, how was that for everyone? The conversation? Insightful? Insightful. Yeah. Enlightening? Yeah. How else? Don't be scared. This is talking time. You know what I mean? We bonded and that. Was the conversation difficult for anybody? Yeah? yeah? <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> and sometimes it's hard listening to other people's stories, right? And I was saying quietly over here, sometimes we're in our, for what I said, for want of a better term, our bubbles, as the mm. government said. Sometimes we get in our <laughs> bubbles and we don't always realise how other people are feeling. Yeah. Sometimes they feel similar to us, sometimes they don't. And I think with COVID and the lockdowns, etc., sometimes we can feel really alone. And we're just getting used to connecting to other people and being around other people. And that's why I think these conversations are really important. So even if you have differing views, it's really important that we start to connect with each other again. Because mm. I think so much of what's happened over COVID, over lockdown, differing opinions and the ways in which they've been explored, I think have removed us and kind of disconnected us a little bit. So I just wanted to thank you so much because I come to all of your individual groups for being so open, being so honest with your feelings. Um, being able to come together and have these conversations because they're never easy. Believe it or not, as a presenter, I can be quite shy as well. So I know for some people, you know, getting into groups of people that you may or may not know, sometimes that's difficult as well. So in the least condescending way, I don't want to sound like uncle inside the room, but you know, well done in coming together and having that convo. <laughs> yeah, give yourselves a clap, you know what I mean? We're not too, we're not too cool in here. Um, but yeah, so again, thank you for being open. And if anything you've spoken about tonight, as I said, has been triggering, um, we have a trained therapist on hand who you can chat to. Even if nothing has been triggering, but you'd like to have a chat with them, they'll be wandering around the next half hour for the next half hour. So make sure you grab that person. The therapist inside the room, can you raise your hand? Well, I'll point them out a bit later on. <laughs> but they're here, you know what I mean? We got you. <laughs> Um, great. Great, thank you. <laughs> Does anyone want to share anything that came up for them in their group? Not a straight no. No, nobody? What about facilitators? Do you want to share anything that came up? Why might people either not want to take it or not be engaging? Because they're not being taught in education, taught about not being taught black history, they're only being taught about slavery, nothing about health systems or that kind of history, the history of government and relations. Mm. Um, and then on that side, we also talked about what are your perceptions? Oh, microphone. Now I really want one, <laughs> now I really want one of you to jump in. But, uh, um, yeah, then we talked from there a bit about what are our perceptions of government? Do we trust the NHS? The sense was we might trust the NHS more than we trust government. Uh, we might trust some celebrities. It's always a hard line, but some kind of influencers, activists, we might okay. believe when, we're when they're talking about their personal experience. I think someone was talking about kind of seeing an activist talk about their experience of their dad having COVID and really believing that story because it's a personal story of someone you know, someone whose views you might agree with or whose like just life experience you might know and how that might help but on the other side 
it might not always be the best because they're out for it for themselves or someone talked about seeing like a campaign and then it having hashtag ad on the bottom and you're like is that okay. genuine information if they're just trying to lead you a certain way um, we talked about the role of kind of community and faith leaders how you might trust them more um, yeah and I think you touched on a great point there as well it, sometimes a disconnect between medical professionals and the government and we saw that with like Chris Whitty, he was saying one thing and sometimes the government was saying something different. Mm. And what I got from some of your conversations is the importance of cohesion. And I think Vina, you touched on this so well in the beginning, where you get your information from and always being inquisitive and always questioning what that information is from and what it's based on. And I heard a lot of that in the groups um, that I went to. Is there anything you both want to add before I throw it out to the other facilitators? Um, yeah, I, I thought it was, it was very thought provoking. We had a, a bunch, a bunch of stuff said in terms of we discussed the situation in America. We discussed diseases such as sickle cell that affect a lot of people in black communities mm. and those feeling like the NHS didn't really prioritize me in my time of need. So why should I trust them now mm. that they've brought out this vaccine to help me, etc. like that. And we discussed that black people, especially black women, have been disproportionately affected in, in the NHS in terms of not being taken seriously and whatnot and what kind of snowball effect that has had on their further treatments and when people actually seek doctor, seek a doctor. So like health behaviours in black communities versus health behaviours in white communities. If you go and ask um, a lot of white people, especially the older ones, they, they trust their doctor. I can tell some of these people anything. I can tell them the sky is falling down and they'll believe me like, okay, cool, it's falling down, <laughs> let me get my umbrella. But then you speak to some of your younger black patients, you tell them, no, you need to be like, and they're like, ah, oh, doctor, do I really got to take this though? And they're like, yeah. if you don't want to see me again and you want to get better, then yes, you do. They're like, oh, but my man told me that I could actually do this and I don't actually have to take the antibiotic. I'm like, don't know who your man is, but it doesn't work with me because you better <laughs> take these antibiotics, boy. That's how you have to do it. And so you, you kind of like approach different patients, different patients in different ways. And I think we touched on it there in terms of people's NHS experiences mm -hmm. and whether or not that would actually, you know, help them make an informed decision about whether or not they want to take the vaccine, as who's giving them that information, where they're getting the information and how skeptical people can be. I think that was a really important thing because at the end of it, that's what it's going to come down to. Mm. You're only going to take something that you trust is going to either help you or get you better in some sort of way. If you don't think that's the case or you think it's actually going to do the opposite, then you might be in trouble. I think, I don't know if this gentleman might be saying, he, he spoke about how he knew somebody who actually wasn't supposed to take the vaccine because there's a small, small group of people medically who we advise not to take it, especially in the beginning due to some of the side effects or previous adverse effects with stuff that might be found in the vaccine. And then he was actually encouraged to take it and develop serious side effects and ended up in hospital. And so obviously if he hears this, he's going to be thinking, who encouraged you to take it knowing you shouldn't be taking it? Like, what was their agenda? Is it just as many people to take it as possible? Or do they actually care about people's health and well-being? And that was a very good point. And you see that in communities and people's personal experiences. The same way Dr. Vina and I have had our personal experiences with COVID and patients, other people have had their personal experiences with doctors and they always haven't been positive. And that's what helps people make decisions. So that's very, very important to know that obviously at a ground level mm -hmm. from us, we have our patients' best interests at heart. However, the representation at the top of the NHS may not be on the same level. Okay. So that cohesion you're talking about needs to be from the pa people who are actually seeing the patients in these communities and the people making the decisions at the yeah, top. top down. Yeah, and I think it was interesting. Um, we had quite a few young people tell us they felt a bit left out where everything was targeted towards adults with mm. big words, big language that they couldn't really relate to. And right at the end where things were dying down, it was like, oh yeah, let's not forget the young people mm. and throw a few ads in. And it's like, but did you forget about us the entire time? Yeah. And I was saying from our perspective, the truth is when we were at that verge of trying to save lives, we didn't even fathom we'd have to vaccinate our young people. Mm. The key was, let's protect the vulnerable, protect numbers and masses as a whole, and you know, then take it forward because children and young people, when they were getting COVID, majority just presented like a cold or a flu. Some, um, lots of young people um, got some skin rashes, you know, dermatological presentations, um, but nothing that made them go into hospital, nothing that put them on a ventilator, nothing that took a life. You know, in some way, which we could still, you know, go to bed thinking we didn't lose any child over this. Mm. But when it came to vaccinating young people, they just, I feel like what I got from this was they felt a bit left out, that there wasn't a clear dialogue, um, that we will get to the young people. Or, you know, it's, it's, it's a process. 
But I think the reality is we were hoping it would never even come to it. But as time went on, we realized everyone needs to be protected because in essence, who are you going home to? Your parents. Mm -hmm. Who are you going home to? Your grandparents. Mm -hmm. And we want to protect, you know, not just yourself, each other, but our vulnerable as a society. So it was actually really, really insightful to hear actually. Yeah. And I think you've raised an important point that I think came up in a lot of groups. All of this stuff sits on a bigger backdrop. Mm. Right, so feeling left out when it comes to vaccinations, mm. and then you look at youth services being cut, and mm. maybe how the youth are treated in, you know, in newspapers, in the media, how communities treat the youth. So when you you feed vaccination into that, and then feeling like a lot of young people feeling like they're a, a last thought or a last yeah. consideration, it sits on a much bigger backdrop. And I think that's why, again, and I keep saying this, this is why these conversations are so important. I mean, do you have a point to make? No, I'm joking. <laughs> yep. That's why these conversations are so yeah. important because they're interconnected. They yeah. don't just exist in silos. All of this stuff is connected. And when we feel something, it's never just usually based on one thing. It's a number of experiences that we've had or a number of messages that tell us something about ourselves or the way that we're valued by other people. Yeah. Um, facilitators, is there anything else you want to add that hasn't been covered? Uh, no, I think uh, the conversation was really um i think one of the things that was flagged that was really around the trust mm -hmm. issue with the government and even with the nhs knowing it could be a separate thing but um there was lack of empathy at the beginning and that sort of cut away with um a lot of people disconnecting so that was really a highlight of that conversation mm -hmm. um i think the what i found that was kind of interesting was do people kind of feel um, scared now of their, you know, what could possibly happen, you know, their side effects or of taking the COVID after you've taken the COVID? And everyone's pretty much feel they've done it now, so mm. they're kind of reassured. Um, so, yeah, and, and I think the last bit was that how COVID has made everyone more political or more politically conscious about a lot of things, especially with the lockdown, with a lot of other things that were happening in between yeah. that space. Yeah. So I think it was a space for everyone to kind of now know a lot of the issues mm. that the community has been going through and the inequalities and yeah. everything around that. So, um, and how we should not be accepting that. So yeah, I think that was, even though we didn't touch it, but I thought that was a, a really kind of a way to end yeah. that con because it's made everyone a lot more slightly politically yeah. conscious about what's going on. So, yeah. That's Thank you. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, I think um, Richie made a very, very good point when he said, in terms of the view and like how people are viewed uh, by the government, it's all, it all kind of intertwines. So when you think of like how the government views young black boys in London, as in what the news portrays about young black boys in London. When you see the news, Sky News, BBC News, The Guardian, read the paper, and you see young black boys' face on there, how much of it is positive? When is it ever positive news? Chances are it's not. Chances are it's something to do with crime. Chances are it could be to do with knife crime. Chances are it could be to do with anything. But it's never something positive. And when you're, it's perpetuated that you're seeing people who look like you and people from your communities it negatively portrayed in the news all the time, you're thinking, they don't care about me or us or this. So, like, Okay, a show of hands. Who here genuinely feels valued as a priority by the government? <laughs> One person. Uh, that, that, kind, that kind of, you know, reiterates my point. And when you have that sort of perception and that sort of thinking, that's when you're not going to trust somebody you don't feel valued by. Like, if you genuinely, show of hands, if you felt genuinely valued by the government, would you trust the vaccine a lot more? Yes. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly, and I think that's something we need to take from here and go back and we obviously feed back. I work with some of the government officials now and we feed back to them <coughs> what our communities are saying and how we think we could better treat our vulnerable people, which is the black and minority ethnic community. And so I think that was a point that we had, which has now obviously been reiterated by you guys and you know, consolidated and solidified here. And I think that's a very good point you brought up. Thank you. And finally, is there anything you want to add as a facilitator? Yeah, I was just going to um, add in our conversations were quite <coughs> as it's already been said. I think one of the key things for us that came up is around like people's take up of the vaccine <coughs> and around 
the fact like now you have to have a booster vaccine and why that it the reasoning behind why you need a booster vaccine and i think there was also some confusion around a lot of people in our group thought it was for older people with a booster vaccine but from the conversations it seems like it may be for everyone so it would be good to get some like clarification around that as well thank you Is it, yeah so that? yeah yeah so when it comes to the um the booster now obviously you're eligible only to get your booster six months after you've had your second dose. So I know a number of people here may have had only one dose already. So you need to get your second dose first and then you'd be eligible for your booster. The boosters basically come in to protect the most vulnerable people. I work in uh, the NHS in A&E and every winter we have winter pressures. And this was before COVID. Every winter is winter pressures. I remember last year was so difficult that obviously that's one of the reasons we went into that Christmas lockdown and Christmas got cancelled real quick. As in to a point that was where, real quick yeah, it was, it was my birthday week too. I had plans, bookings, all that made, <laughs> shut down, lock off. Immediately, I was devastated. But I was working and I knew how, how busy it was getting to the point where I wasn't even seeing patients in A&E. I was going out to ambulances to see patients wow. because we didn't have space. We didn't have trolleys left. We didn't have space left in the department. And so that's why we have this booster now because we know winter months, you're more likely, you're more susceptible res for respiratory disease with people being inside and the change in humidity, viruses, this is when they thrive. This is, a virus thrives like Michael Bublé. Every Christmas, it comes out. Oh. <laughs> and so, and because of that, that's why we're getting the vulnerable people the booster. So if they do contract COVID, <coughs> then they're very less, less likely to get severely ill and get admitted in the hospital and it frees up the NHS and stops people dying. Obviously, because of how many boosters we have, there are younger people who've now had their second jabs, at least after six months. And those people over the age of 16 who have underlying chronic conditions are eligible for their booster too. If that, I hope that clears that up. Sorry, <coughs> I, don't know. I think you, you want to point something out? Yeah, I was going to ask, like, how, would you, how do you think Christmas is going to be this year? Do you think we might have a lockdown? Or? <laughs> Honestly, so I'm hoping yeah, yeah. basically trending on how yeah, things were last year, based on how this year, things are looking much better this year. I believe that we will have a Christmas. However, I believe the NHS and A&E is going to be very, very busy. Yeah, yeah, tomorrow will be fine. I'm not going to lie to you, it's going to be a busy one, but hey, it's what we signed up for. I think there'll be a lot less deaths and a lot less severely, people, severely ill people in ITU because of the vaccine and because of the booster. So now I know 80-year-olds, 90-year-olds who are still getting COVID, but they're just having a tough, a tough week at home with mild symptoms. Whereas had that been last year, they'd be in A&E and probably be in ITU. So it's going to be a busy one like it is every year. That's just how the NHS works. That's how disease works. But hopefully because of the booster and because so many people have been vaccinated from not only COVID but had their flu jabs, because we offer over 60s a flu jab every year for free in the NHS, hopefully we're going to see a lot less patients in A&E and it should be better. But I mean, I went there and predicted that COVID wasn't going to be as severe as it was right at the and beginning. And here we are. And here we are. 2022 coming. I remember I was on Good Morning Britain <laughs> with a plaque in front of me in a suit talking about how, oh, well, we have it under control and I think it's going to be good. And then the next picture I was was full PPE, sweating, crying on a COVID ward. So. Not this you. I'm so got you, in it. Guys, yeah. you Please don't worry. That's just having a cold when you come to a COVID talk is not the one. <laughs> are you okay? Yeah. I thought them sour seats got you. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's going to be an interesting one. We're going to play it by ear. But the thing is, we have a lot more information now than we did last year, which is the main thing. Not in terms of just vaccinating people, but in terms of treating COVID as well. Mm. So I was involved in the recovery trial where we were testing a number of different uh, treatments for COVID and for people who are on long-term oxygen. I worked on the high, res high dependency respiratory unit. So basically everyone was getting high flow oxygen because their lungs were just shattered. And back then we didn't have that many answers. Before we came into work, they actually gave us a 72 page document about treating COVID and all the stuff we had to read and go over it. So a lot of us now have that information in our heads so we can identify COVID. The track and trace system has helped loads. As in nowadays, if you've got COVID, you're getting a text or somebody's giving you a text that you've been um, exposed to somebody with COVID. So you know not to go out, you know to stay home, you know when to isolate. This is a lot of stuff we didn't really have last year. And that's why it was so difficult. So hopefully with the implications of all this stuff, it's going to be a better Christmas. That's the news that we wanted, you know. Yeah. I'm trying to get some presents out of it. <laughs> um, it was all Amazon last year. <laughs> um, we've got five minutes left. So has anyone got a burning point or a question that they want to ask before we wrap? 
I made that really pressurized, didn't I? <laughs> Probably it, shouldn't have done it in that here's way. Here's your chance. Go ahead. Um, so I was going to ask, in terms of people that are kind of um, against the vaccine, yeah. And, oh, you mean <laughs> you mean um, anti-vaxxers? Yeah, anti-vaxxers, yeah. um, and then maybe some of them are towards kind of like health remedies and everything. Mm. How could you perhaps work with them um, if they don't believe in like um, traditional science per se? That's a good question. Let me you take yeah. <laughs> Please. Pick me. I'll tell you why. Because this really hurts me as a GP. I do baby clinics every Thursday morning. I do six-week checks on little ones who are born to check everything's okay. And after they see me, they see the nurse to get the vaccinations. And you always have the parent who says, I don't believe in that, right? And I'll tell you why this is painful. Because I've done a pediatric job where we have seen children with things like measles, mumps, with rubella. This is part of your MMR. You know the MMR vaccine that we get at 12 months? It can be avoided if you get the vaccine. But we've seen those little kids in paediatric ICU struggling to live. Some of them have lost their lives because somebody decided they don't believe in vaccinations, right? And that's with conditions in childhood. So when it comes to anti-vaxxers, you're absolutely right. On one hand, there might not be enough data. It's only been a year old. You're absolutely right, but we're all in the same boat. We've all taken it. We're all in this together. How, how do you, you tell us, how, how, would, you, how would you tackle it? <laughs> no, um, the reason why I kind of asked that was in terms of like, um, would you say there's a link of like just healthy lifestyle? Um, yeah, 100%. And like obviously taking the vaccine as well. Like, do you think that it's just mainly taking the vaccine that will protect you? Or do you think you also need to have like a healthy no, lifestyle? it's in conjunction. Well? 100%. It's in conjunction, it's, it's, yeah. it's a two and two. The, the vaccine is just something we've implanted which can help a lot of people however preventative medicine is always the best medicine so if you can keep yourself genuinely healthy that's what i was doing i keep myself genuinely healthy i take my vitamins i'm making sure i'm eating well i make sure i'm trying to be in the gym if i can be if i'm not on call because all this stuff if you do get covid we know that chronic conditions especially morbid obesity diabetes hypertension a lot of this stuff severe lung disease from you can get from long-term smoking we know that a lot of this stuff negatively affected about eight percent of the people who were in the itu at the height of the pandemic were obese compared to um it's a lot shorter in the population and so we saw the patients who were in there and many of them had chronic conditions many of them hadn't taken care of themselves a lot of the younger ones who were suffering so i do believe obviously the vaccines are the way forward and i believe medicine is the way forward i believe in modern medicine but for me if i could avoid taking any medication i genuinely would and that's me coming as a doctor However, I know there's certain, certain conditions where you have to take medication, where there is no yeah. alternative. But it's not a replacement, right? It's, it's not, in conjunction. Yeah, it's not a replacement, yeah. it's an additive. It doesn't mean yeah. take the vaccine, but cool, you can be then, yeah, smoking out yeah. here, living, and doing whatever you want to yeah. do. Just a that. little bit of living. <laughs> <so. laughs> every, every, yeah. every Friday night, a little bit of living. Yeah. But like, genuinely, I think that there, there is medicine that's not modern medicine. I believe that some methods of alternative medicine are good. I think even if it's just a placebo effect, even if it's just that you're taking something and you think you're getting better, I've seen it in patients where they've taken something and thought they're getting better. I've seen experiments where people are giving sugar pills and all of a sudden, like they're, all of a sudden they're recovering <laughs> from cancer. And you're thinking, what? We gave them sugar pills. Where's this cancer going? Like, there's a lot to do with the mind and medicine, and there's a huge, yeah. huge link with it. So I, I don't believe that all alternative, alternative medicine is bad. However, I do believe you can't just completely disregard modern medicine, especially because of the studies and how far we progress. Like modern medicine, the, the, uh, the invention of modern medicine, the antibiotics, one of the greatest discoveries since clean water, time, yeah. like of all time, it's prevented more deaths than anything. So, mm. and, that's, and that's like fact. Yeah. If you get ill, you get tonsillitis, you get ill, you get a chest infection, you're going to be taking antibiotics. Where does that come from? Modern medicine, <laughs> trials, companies. Mm. So it's the same thing with these vaccines. This is going to be something that's going to be around for a long time and these vaccines are going to help us. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be living in a good, healthy behavior and practicing good, yeah. healthy techniques. When I'm out now, just literally, second nature, I'm gelling my hands. Because I, although, although I know um, I've been vaccinated, I know I want to reduce the chance of getting COVID. I don't want to text yeah. in I got COVID. I have to isolate for 10 days. Mm. Nobody wants that. I'm trying to live life. Especially if I booked a flight somewhere. <laughs> Whew, stress. Nobody yeah. wants to get COVID, but there's still a way you need to live to make sure you're giving yourself the best, the best fighting chance, chance yeah. if you do contract COVID. Because yeah. you know there is a chance you can still get COVID even if you've been vaccinated. Yeah. And I wouldn't want that. I wouldn't want to pass it to my parents. I wouldn't want to pass it to my patients. I wouldn't want to pass it to any of you guys. Mm. So Thank I hope you. that helps.
I'll be signing up to the gym after this. <laughs> um, so yeah, I just want to thank you all so much for coming today. I just want to read out a few resources before I wrap up. So this is the close and the food is coming. Don't worry. So um, in terms of resources, there's Young Minds. Instagram is at Young Minds UK. It's a mental health charity for children, young people and their parents, making sure all young people can get the mental health support they want. Also, if you want to grab me afterwards and I'm going through it too fast, do. Because I saw you I'm about to take out your phone, I'll send it to you. Um, Black Minds Matter, their mission is to connect black individuals and families with free mental health services by black therapists to support their mental health. There's BAME Stream. Bereavement support, they provide free culturally competent brief, sorry, grief emotional online support to anyone black, Asian or from a minority ethnic background. Only three more, I promise. The Good Grief Trust, the Good Grief Trust exists to help all those affected by grief in the UK. Bolo is Bernardo's COVID helpline and web chat for those aged 11 and over who identify as black, Asian or minority ethnic. You can see a theme here. And the final one is Spark & Co, an online resource hub founded amidst the pandemic after seeing there was a disproportionate negative effect on racialized communities. Um, so we'll be pushing out a load of content and resources and more on the Break Comms Instagram channel. So make sure you follow that at Break underscore comms and uh, please go and eat and hang around i will be here to chat but give yourselves a round of applause for today so i'm here with richie brave bro how was it fantastic lots of information lots of open conversation just something that i think is important to be honest a thousand percent the one question i want to ask you is what's the one thing you wish everybody knew about covid or the one thing you'd like to tell everybody about COVID? I would say how it affects families. And as somebody who nearly lost their dad to COVID and I've lost people that I love to COVID, I want them to understand the emotional impact of it and how it affects people. Because I think sometimes when it hasn't affected you directly, you don't believe it's real or you don't understand how much it hurts families. So for me, it's connecting to the emotional side of things. Take the politics out, take the numbers out. Think about the community and the people that it's directly affected thousand percent that's a very good thought and then on the subject of thoughts what's your final thought my final thought of today yes sir yes sir uh in one word it'll be community community there you go Come ladies on. and gentlemen richie brave bad bitch pose <laughs> hello guys i am here minus a booster box with the amazing emeka so brother how was the actual panel I thought, I thought it was really good. I, one, I was impressed with the turnout. We got there eventually. <laughs> there were a bunch of people came and I felt like it was very like inquisitive. So a lot of people like, actually had genuine concerns and questions. And hopefully the information we gave them today, they can go back and not only to retain that information, but actually tell people, you know what? We spoke to these doctors and they came and we asked these questions and then they can go to the community and actually spread the information. So even if people weren't here, they're still getting the same info that, as if they would. A thousand percent, a thousand percent. So my next question, final question, you've had a lot of questions today. So the final question is, what is the one thing you wish everybody knew about COVID? I think the one thing I think everybody should know is just how destructive and deadly COVID is. I think a lot of people do know because they've been infected. However, I think there's so many people out there who don't actually realize how, how, the, how destructive it is. I think if more people knew, a lot of people wouldn't be questioning COVID. They wouldn't be they wouldn't be questioning the vaccine, and people would actually be walking and you know walking and going out in public and acting sensibly, making sure they're washing their hands and making sure they're wearing their masks, making sure they're socially distancing if appropriate. If they knew just how devastating COVID is, and that's something that people won't know unless they've seen it themselves. But I myself have seen it, and I wish everyone had seen it too. Sweet, thank you. And now, any final thoughts? Final thoughts are where are we going to go from here in terms of how, how many people will get vaccinated, how many people will have the booster, and is this going to be a regular thing that occurs every year where we have our booster jabs from COVID? Possibly. However, is it something that could potentially not eradicate but at least control COVID to the point where we can live our daily lives? Hopefully. And that's, that's my final thought. All right. Thank you very much. Yes, so I'm here with the amazing Dr. Vino, who, if I had known I would be doing this today, I would have actually done my hair. <laughs> but it's a bit late now. How have you found the panel? How's oh, it been today? Well, really sweet. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> Thanks for having me here. Um, I actually really enjoyed it. 
I, I enjoyed talking about what some of our true experiences were. I enjoyed listening to what all the young minds had to say. And I think I learned a thing or two myself. So thank you for having me. Lovely. So I'm going to expand on that a bit. Like, what kind of things have you learned? Honestly, what really stuck with me was when a lot of young people thought that they were forgotten or that they didn't feel that the government thought about them as priority and they felt that they were just left behind and were an afterthought in the whole vaccination schedule, which I can see why they thought that way. And it was interesting to kind of start that dialogue and explain we had to, you know, think about the vulnerable groups first and then get to, you know, work down the age groups. But I can see from their perspective, it seemed like they were just not a priority and then it came to them afterwards. Yeah. A thousand percent. So then my final question to you is, what is one thing, I've asked everyone this question, what is one thing you wish you knew, you wish other people knew about COVID? Mm, that it's real. <laughs> <laughs> that it is real um, and I say that because there are still groups of people who think it isn't not just in our country but also recently I just went to East Africa and came back and there they think it's a myth they don't even think it's real because I guess they haven't had as many deaths it's not been as serious but there are still people who don't think it's real so I I would say I just wish everyone knew the depth of how real it is yeah, yeah. most definitely and any final thoughts I'm just really grateful to be here to share the space with such amazing people. Thank you, Soapbox. Thank you, Break Home, for having me. And I hope we do this again. Cool. Wonderful. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you're amazing. Dr. Vino. Thanks, guys. <laughs>